February 1898, the first battleship ever built by the United States and pride of the Navy, the USS Maine, was blown up at the harbor in Havana, Cuba, and the incident became a major catalyst that caused the Spanish-American War. Teddy Roosevelt and his famous Rough Riders take control of Cuba, while General Nelson Miles invades Puerto Rico and takes control of the famous fort El Morro. In March 1917, the U.S. Congress grants citizenship to Puerto Ricans, and President Woodrow Wilson signs the bill into law. A month later, America entered World War I. 17,000 Puerto Ricans served in the war to end all wars. Many died serving our country. At about the same time, Pedro Albizu Campos, a Puerto Rican nationalist, joined the U.S. Army and later becomes a major political figure in the independence movement for the island of Puerto Rico. The political status of the island of Puerto Rico gets international attention due to the nationalist uprising of 1950, then the attacks on the U.S. Congress and the attempted assassination of President Harry S. Truman. Pedro Alvisu Campos and his compatriots are arrested and sent to prison. Under the leadership of Luis Muñoz Marín, the first freely elected governor, the island becomes the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. We were war booty in 1898 as a result of the Spanish-American War. And in 1917, we were given citizenship. Unlike any other immigrants, we were then migrants. And because we were migrants, we had the ability to vote as U.S. citizens and instantly upon establishing residence, you could vote. The early migration begins, and Puerto Ricans trek to the mainland. After the turn of the century, after the Spanish-American War, uh, the biggest presence of Puerto Ricans in the city, in the state, was as a result of a labor migration. Uh, labor contractors would go down to the island, hire men and women, uh, and they would just you know, come up here, uh, settled in Chelsea, settled in the uh, around the Brooklyn Navy Yards, working in, for instance, the American Manufacturing Corporation. So they were laborers mostly. And as well, we also see that skilled tradesmen, uh, tabaqueros, uh, who were highly politicized and highly organized, uh, would make their presence felt here in New York City. Early discrimination begins, and incidents of violence against Puerto Ricans were common. And in retaliation, they begin to build a political community in the 1920s with the establishment of organizations like the Liga Puerto Ricana, the Puerto Rican Nationalist Association, and the Club Democrático Hispano Americano. Puerto Ricans marched on Washington. We had and I say we because I was one of the, the, the organizers and leaders of this group, together with Alberto uh, Helena uh, Valentin. We organized some 50 buses from all over the country to go and march into Washington. And included in that group was uh, Tito Puente and his, and his band. Uh, and we took I think about 50 people per, per, per bus. So there were some several thousand people that went down there. The new political leaders such as Herman Badillo, Angelo del Toro, Gilberto Herrera Valentin, Father Luis Gigante, and Ramon Vélez emerge and begin their quest for political power and control of the anti-poverty funds. Herman Badillo was always a very articulate person who took on issues, citywide issues, but he was running for district leader in Harlem while we were running in the Bronx. Uh, Ramon Velas was beginning to form his organization, focusing in on the organizing of Puerto Ricans. Uh, Elena Valentin was organizing these groups, these social town groups, etc., and the Congress of Municipalities and things like that. In other words, the, the Hispanic community was becoming awakened and alive and everyone was participating, do whatever they did, 
was a good contribution to the development of consciousness. Tony Mendez, which was the first district leader in El Barrio, he was very instrumental, this particular individual, and I have to give you, uh, you know, the honor to, uh, to Tony Mendez, and you should do it also, because of the fact he was the one that discussed the matter with, at the time the, the mayor was over the Juano, to make sure that the Puerto Rican would be what you call a commissioner. And you know who's that Puerto Rican? Herman Badillo. He was a, the first commissioner of relocation on the city of New York. I was faced with political act, act activity in, in the neighborhood. And I stopped one day and I started talking to a lady named, who's still with us, named Belen Dennis. And in those days, in about 1964, 65, she had an organization, Los Amigos de Germán Badillo. And Herman was, Badillo was running for board president. So I stopped and I asked questions, how can I get involved? And that really was the first time that I really uh, got active with, 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 with electoral politics by becoming a volunteer in the effort to make Herman Badillo the first uh, Puerto Rican board president of, of the Bronx. Uh, I haven't stopped ever since I, uh, being active. Uh, we elected Herman Badillo. There was so much pride in those days, being the first Puerto Rican. Uh, we have a, a very uh, energetic community, uh, very excited. Uh, people were registering to vote by the thousand. Uh, so I was active in that campaign. Robert Wagner appointed me as uh, first as deputy commissioner and then as the, as the first Puerto Rican commissioner in the history of New York City, commissioner of housing relocation. And I served <coughs> for three years as commissioner of housing relocation. That enabled me to get to be known citywide as the first commissioner. In 1965, I ran for borough president in the Democratic Party primary against the Democratic Party organization, and I beat them. And then I ran against Joseph Perricone, who was a Republican liberal candidate, and I beat him. And so I became the first uh, borough president in the history of New York City. If we are going to use the force of government to help the poor, we need the participation of the poor in the political process. Make sure that you register now. Register this week, register this month, and come out and vote in November. Ramon Velez started with me when I was a commissioner of housing relocation. He came to see me one day and he said that he was a social worker. And he had the idea of establishing a multi-service center in the South Bronx. And would I help him? I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So I worked with Ramon and we got the Hunts Point Multi-Service Center approved which became a very successful operation. Hiberto Gravalentin is a very important political figure. His uh, initial political base was associated with the development of the hometown clubs, the clubs from the uh, municipalities in Puerto Rico, Cabo Rojo, Mayagüez, all the towns uh, that visit, come help people when they moved here to Puerto Rico. They played a very important role in the organization of the, uh, of the Puerto Rican Day Parade. Uh, and so this all infrastructure of uh, community-based organizations <coughs> tied up to hometowns in Puerto Rico, and Herrera Valentin plays a very, very important role in nourishing that leadership and connecting it to the larger issues in the city. Herrera Valentin, to me, was a pioneer. He knew of cultures, very highly educated person. Uh, he also knew the political system. He knew how to deal within the political system. Uh, of course, you, you deal and you become boisterous, like anybody else, I was called a revolutionary too because I always opened my mouth and I always, that never kept my mouth shut. And then I wanted to think was revolutionary. He was a communist, supposedly. Immediately stereotypes, you know, they're putting situations on him. He became a city council person, you know. He was also a commissioner in the city of New York. But always try to maintain the culture, cultural values here for the people in the borough of the Bronx and other places as well in, 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 uh, in the other five boroughs. The other element which is crucial to understand uh, Helena Valentin's importance is his links to labor. I mean, here's someone who was, uh, who gets um, his first political battles working for Marco Antonio in his Harlem, you know? And he learns the, the rough side uh, of, of politics of, of that generation. He is someone that is gonna keep the ties 
uh, of the labor movement and of the Puerto Ricans and Hispanics in the labor movement very, very connected to uh, the political process when he, I mean, when he signed to the city council uh, and to some of the other groups that he worked with. So he's someone who bridges a lot of um, community um, elements, hometown clubs, labor, youth groups. So he's a very, very important figure in the history of Puerto Rican politics in the city. 1965, in spite of the nasty infighting, community activists along with elected officials gather at a beach resort and begin to strategize on obtaining political power in New York via the ballot box. This strategy, known as the Great Voter Registration Crusade, was to last for more than a dozen years. Let me put it this way. In order for you to really uh, do something, you have to delineate a plan of action with a short range and a long range. And the fact is, we began to see, well, this is a problem. How can we alleviate that problem and make real, uh, a reality that that problem has to be better for all of us? So we strategized. We went to Puerto Rico. I remember very vivid, uh, Hotel San, and some, uh, some leaders. And we went there and we began to say, we had to make sure that we go to every corner of New York City and began to register every person that uh, is available to be uh, a voter. So we began to do what you call La Cruzada Cívica El Voto. And we began to do, even every corner you see a, a, a table registering the Puerto Ricans and all that. And we sent a, a message loud and clear that we're here, so you have to count us. The campaign between um, Jerena Valentin and Ramon Vélez was, um, was intense. Intense to the point where um, We'd get thrown eggs when we would come around in a caravan with trucks. Um, um, there would be fights to the point where we thought that people were going to get killed. There was that kind of threats, and um, it was it was it was intense. So any time that we would go out, we always knew that we had to go out in buddy systems, three or four of us, and. A lot of money was spent during that time in terms of um, literature and posters because as our posters went up an hour later, and we would do this at two or three o'clock in the morning, an hour later after our posters went up, they were down. And if we would catch anybody, that was, that was just ready for a fight. That was just a fist fight right there. And um, too many times we found ourselves that we were actually, af we were afraid. We were afraid of, of what, was to, what was to come up next in terms of that. In that. It's just a growing process. I think that this, is, this happens in, in all cultures. It's, it's as, you, as you become a power base, your, your, your infighting is highlighted much more. Because now, see, you, you always had infighting, but now you have infighting and now you're a senator or, a, or an assemblyman or a congressman. So it's highlighted more. Um, but the infighting is, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, it's for good causes. It's trying to create a strength and trying to, to create um, a knowledge within the masses as to what, what we need to do as a community. A lot of fighting among our political leaders, each trying to tear the other one apart and no kind of unity. By the way, that's not to say that th things have not changed. I think you still find that uh, today also. But uh, whenever you picked up the paper, you would read about Ramon Velez fighting with Herman Batillo, fighting with Helena Valentin, fighting with uh, Armando Montano. There were constant battles, constant bickering. Um, and you thought that one of the fights would develop where somebody would end up as the victor. And there was, there was never any victor, and maybe there are no victors in, in those kinds of battles that politicians engage in. I always sat with Ramon Velez at the community meetings, with Louis Nene at the community meetings. But the problem with Helena Valentin was that he was really a union organizer whom I loved very much. And actually, by fate or by luck, he was elected to the city council. He ran against Ramon Velez. Ramon Velez should have won that seat very easily. It was his second term. But the last minute, Ramon Velez won the election by getting Herena Valentin off the ballot. 
And so all his troops laid low the next day of the election. But in the last minute, the judge put Arena Valentin on the ballot, and he won by a small margin. Should never have won. It was a freak. That's how he became elected. When the anti-poverty programs came into being, uh, approved by Lyndon Johnson after Jack Kennedy was killed, um, Ramon took over many of the anti-poverty centers. And uh, I felt that was a bad idea. I never tried to uh, take over any poverty centers or anything else. I would help people get started, as I did with Ramon, but I would never try to control programs because I felt that that was not the function that as an elected official I should serve. So Ramon took over the poverty centers and he ended up controlling a whole empire because he was head of the South Bronx Multi Service Center. He was head of the uh, poverty programs. He became indirectly through his people head of the uh, community planning board. He became head of the uh, Lincoln Hospital um, community board and he indirectly uh, developed enormous power. The relation between Ramon Vélez, Herman Badillo, and Helena Valentin uh, really, uh, you know, set us back for some 22 years. The history behind the building of the Bronx political machine, where Puerto Ricans now control, has not been an easy road, and much controversy continues to plague the community. How the Bronx became the political epicenter of the Puerto Rican empowerment of this city. You have to go back to the relocation commissioner of the city of New York under Mayor Wagner. His name was Herman Badillo. And he was instructed by then Mayor Wagner they wanted to build a new Lincoln Center. They wanted to build a new Metropolitan Opera House and they relocated in droves from the west side of Manhattan Puerto Ricans to the Bronx. It's no coincidence, or as they say in the Bronx, Coinky thing, that they all ended up in the Bronx. I suspect, though, Mr. Badillo will probably say I'm, you know, getting a little ahead of myself. But quite frankly, that significant issue created a community in the Bronx from the west side of Manhattan that led to the eventual election of a Bronx borough president, a Bronx congressman, and many, many members of the state assembly, state senate, and city council over the years. The situation with the Latino delegation in the Bronx is something that I'm uh, actually very proud of because the, you have a group of leaders th there who have, uh, in addition to empowering uh, Latinos in, in the city, have sought to empower Latinos all over New York State. They actually reached out for me during my campaign. I didn't know any of them. Uh, they reached out for me, offered their support, but they realized that, uh, that true leaders create new leaders and that true power empowers others. And this is a, a key philosophy that they have that has been different, again, from what I was talking about as, as one of our traditional defects in the past in that uh, um, many times we drag each other down. Uh, they've gotten away from that, and they've uh, gone with the philosophy that we should empower each other because together we, as I said before, it, we, it's the tide that rises all ships. One is that, uh, I mean, there's been very significant contribution in terms of, uh, if you think there's been three Puerto Rican border presidents in the Bronx, I mean, the last two, you have a succession of, you know, from uh, Fernando Ferrer to Adolfo Carrion as border president. Uh, you also have a succession of power, if you wish, in the Bronx Democratic Party uh, machinery, from Roberto Ramirez to Jose Rivera. Uh, and, uh, and for many, that would sort of be a signal of political sophistication, of, uh, of maturity within the, the control of the mechanisms of, of, of party politics in, in the Bronx, and that Puerto Rico has, has sort of made it. People who are critical of that would argue that uh, for many years the Puerto Ricans were crying uh, from the outside to be participating and incorporating, and now they have the leadership positions, they need to behave in the way that the bosses behaved in the past. And the people who are excluded from that feel that that is a detriment in terms of Puerto Rican political participation, that for example, when you control the party machinery, you need to deal 
with other groups and you cannot just give every seat possible to a Puerto Rican. You need to then negotiate with the African Americans, with some of the other groups in, in the county to be able to remain a political okay. force. So again, those are the, the pros and cons of, of having achieved this level of, of political maturity. The second element that I want to point out is the different path and political careers of many of the Puerto Rican elected officials in the Bronx as a sign of the complexity and the maturity of the Puerto Rican population in New York City, uh, which often gets characterized as either just recent immigrants or people are coming and going. And it's a very, very, very complex uh, population, which is, you know, the development of now having been here for uh, almost a century. I mean, think about Fernando Ferrer, you know, sort of born here in the United States, made a career, uh, you know, initially in banking, then in city council, gets to be borough president, a very sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of, middle class movement in into politics you compare that with Jose Rivera who comes from a labor background driving taxis struggles in the streets movement into the political system uh, very 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 different kinds of paths to uh, power in in the Bronx uh, Roberto Ramirez migrates from uh, from Puerto Rico uh, goes to uh, Bronx Community College uh, over there because he uh, becomes a lawyer Yes, involves in politics, a very different path mm -hmm. than the one that Jose Rivera has. You have somebody like Adolfo Carrion, who's more of a technocrat, somebody with a master's degree in urban planning from here in Hunter College and a city council career. So I think also that one of the things that's interesting about the Bronx, if you take it for a moment as, as, a, as an example uh, of political politics, is that you see in the current leadership uh, a lot of the different paths and a lot of the stories which make up the, the very complex Puerto Rican story, uh, story in, in New York City and New York State. We have a borough of a million four hundred thousand people. Almost seven hundred thousand of them are Hispanics, Latinos. Four hundred thousand Puerto Ricans, nearly two hundred thousand Dominicans, and a smattering of about another hundred thousand of a mix from Latin America. Mexican Americans are the fastest growing in the, in two, in the, in the early two uh, thousands. Um, and uh, and God knows what's going to happen next. We're getting a growth of people from West Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal. Asians are coming in, Chinese, people from Thailand, Vietnam. Well, I think that the Puerto Rican uh, community has really been the pioneer in, in politics. And people like uh, uh, Herman Badillo and Bobby Garcia and uh, Congressman Serrano and others that came before them actually that uh, they were the pioneers for Latinos in, in this great city and um, as a Dominican uh, I've learned a lot from uh, what I think have been some of their mistakes and some of their positive things so that you know we have the benefit now the, 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 we have the opportunity now uh, to and the privilege to really learn from uh, what other people uh, left the legacy that they left us we stand on other people's shoulder no one stands on their own and uh, you know, I, I dare to say that uh, as an elected official, being the first Dominican elected to, to a state office, I stand on the shoulders of people like uh, uh, Bobby Garcia and Herman Badillo and Serrano and, and others. Anyone can have the same has the same opportunity to take over this organization. What they do with it after they take over remains to be seen. All I am saying is, if we did it, if I contributed to taking over the most powerful so-called machine of Puerto Rican and Latino, I look forward to the day when the Mexican inherits what we did. I look forward for the day when the Dominicans inherits what we contributed to. Abriendo brecha, we open up doors. Fernando Ferrer's 2001 primary campaign for mayor of the city of New York was both a surprise and a disappointment. In 2005, he won the Democratic Party nomination, but he ran against a strong and well-financed incumbent and lost. I think he did extraordinarily well. What occurred is that the liberal community in New York City, the, the trade unions, the liberal establishment, the African-American leaders, the Working Families Party, rushed to endorse uh, Mark Green. 
that they, they wanted to do is to block the, uh, the lawn in Hevesy. And so all the resources within the liberal community were committed right at the beginning to, um, uh, to Mark Green. So uh, going into the primary, um, Ferrer does something utterly un unexpected by most people is that he actually gets the plurality but not the majority. So there's now a runoff between the two leading candidates, between Ferrer and Mark Green. And uh, he almost wins. Well, I decided to run for mayor for a number of reasons. One, I objected viscerally to Rudy Giuliani's politics and politicizing this city and his dividing this city making it a city for the very well-to-do and the privileged and the accessible to his administration and everybody else. I don't think that was right. It isn't the city that I grew up in. Um, I saw a wonderful opportunity to extend economic benefit to people because of the economic boom in the Clinton years that was almost completely wasted in New York. I objected to it. A different view of what the city ought to be. That's really why I ran for mayor. Fernando Ferrer ran for mayor, and everybody said at the very beginning, he doesn't have the heart. He doesn't, the Latinos will not come out to vote. He cannot put the coalition between him, La Hispanics, African Americans, I can't do that. Fernando Ferrer will not raise the money. The community is not ready. Well, Fernando Ferrer, Ferrer raised as much money as anybody else. Fernando Ferrer got the, the Hispanic community for once in this city manifested its political muscle. It went from 13% of the citywide vote in 1997 to 23% in 2001. Fernando Ferrer won a primary. He beat Mark Green, he beat uh, Alan Hevesy, he beat Peter Vallone. The kid from the Bronx, the one that wasn't even supposed to be able to get out of first, the, out of the gate, won a primary in a city that supposedly only Hispanics were 13% of the vote. I believe that something happened in the Puerto Rican community in this city. I believe that we understood that when you commit an act such as, as vile, as using a racist message to defeat the Puerto Rican, that you will have to pay a price for it. I believe that history will show that we changed the political landscape and the political climate in the city of New York. Actually, I know we did because other people wrote about it. The New York Times wrote about it, so it must be true. The new generation of political leaders is tackling the issues of job opportunities and economic development. Some of the issues is economic development, the fact that we really need to make sure that we have a good economic development stimulus plan to make sure we can create jobs. I'm part of the fact that just a couple of weeks ago we were able to celebrate the creation of a new Pathmark shopping center right here within my district. This is something that my father has been trying to you know, get established for the, for the past decade and now when I was elected to the city council I had to carry on the agenda and make sure that we were able to solidify this Pathmark center. That is creating over 400 jobs locally. 90% of the people that are employed are from the Bronx and 75% of the people actually live within the exact neighborhood where the Pathmark Center is. That's what it's about. When I asked what are you, I always say Puerto Rican. But I've learned that I have to change that now. And because people say, what part of Puerto Rico are you from? And then I say I'm from New York, and they laugh at me. <laughs> because obviously New York is not in Puerto Rico. And so now I've learned to say I'm Puerto Rican from New York. I am a New Yorker. I'm from here, and even though I was born here, I'm from over there too. And by over there, I mean Puerto Rico, not the Bronx, not Manhattan, not El Barrio, not the South Side. But to be a Puerto Rican in New York is also to feel a kinship with what's over there in the island. We're from the Caribbean, a place where Africa, Europe, and Native American culture met. Uh, it means to be a survivor. So it means that you're, you're strong, you have a deep inner strength that propels you. It means to be proud of family. To be Puerto Rican means to be a, a, a product of extreme sacrifice and pride and great expectations um, for my generation and the generations that come after us. What makes us different is that we have an intense passion 
for Puerto Rico, even though we never lived there. We're one people, we're Puerto Rican, and our nation is Puerto Rico. I will be proud of uh, being a Puerto Rican. That's something that, uh, whether it's the Bronx or anywhere else, my camarero is always a Puerto Rican. And the Puerto Rican story is just that. It plays out in the Bronx in a very special way because there's almost 400,000 Puerto Ricans in the Bronx. Starting at the, at the very beginning of the documented history of the Puerto Rican migration um, really means that we start in the late 19th century. Over the history of the city of New York, there's always been Puerto Ricans here. You can go back to the earliest years of the founding of this country, you will find Puerto Rican merchants who probably possibly didn't identify themselves as Puerto Ricans per se, but they were from Puerto Rico. There was a, a small community of um, political leaders who were involved in the independence movement, uh, along with uh, political leaders from Cuba. Over time, you found some of the revolutionaries from the failed revolution in the 1860s, whether it be Betances or Hostos, were here in New York City, putting down roots among the merchants, among people who found jobs here in the tobacco or cigar making business. Again, a very, very important crop and a very important business for people from the islands and for, for Puerto Ricans as well. After the U.S. took over Puerto Rico in 1898, uh, after defeating the Spanish in Cuba and acquiring Puerto Rico as a uh, territory, uh, the scenery was beginning to change. The economy of Puerto Rico is largely agricultural and there is a widespread poverty uh, on the island. People continued to come from Puerto Rico after 1898 when the U.S. took over the island. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, that uh, migration increased as a result of World War I when many Puerto Ricans served in the war. Uh, Puerto Ricans were citizens, therefore served in the armed forces. Uh, that plus the fact that uh, there had already been uh, Puerto Ricans here um, in New York City motivated many of the groups that are referred to as the pioneros, the very first people to come. And they came in the 20s and 30s in fairly substantial numbers. My father came to the States in 1924. Uh, my grandfather in Puerto Rico was a doctor at the time. He was uh, very popular in uh, our hometown, Bayamón. And my grandfather sent my father, when he was about uh, 18 years old, something like that, to the state, to New York, to study medicine because he was a doctor and he wanted his son to be a doctor too. My grandmother's sister, Doña Vicenta, uh, had come here in 1931, and in order to help the family in Puerto Rico, um, she brought my mother over first. And so this way, my grandmother would only have two other daughters to take care of and not three. Well, the first member of my family to come to New York was my uh, grandmother. Uh, her name was uh, Jenny Torres Guzman Padilla. And she came uh, around 1940. Uh, she was the first one to come to the United States. She went to work in the garment uh, uh, industry, garment center in Midtown Manhattan. Felipe Torres, my father, came to New York in order to better his circumstances, and in turn, as the head of his family, because my grandfather was already deceased, he brought the rest of his family, his mother and his three siblings, to New York, and it was to better themselves, their, their, their economic conditions, but it was with the intention of returning to Puerto Rico. My father came in the 50s, and they came because um, the situation in Puerto Rico was very tough for them and they, they mostly worked in agriculture and they came here to work in factories and they came here and worked in other people's homes taking care of children and cleaning houses because there was more opportunity here for them to kind of make it and in Puerto Rico it became very very difficult. What prompted my mother to come to New York City I guess her own impetus her own heart El corazón que tiene mi mamá you know she, she's a very brave woman a very feisty woman I've inherited some of those qualities. <laughs> she wanted to get outside of the realm of just living in the countryside. She wanted to become more educated and see the world. 
My parents came to New York because this was the place where all the jobs were back then. There was some family here already. Uh, my father's three brothers had preceded him to New York City. I think the big thing that attracted a lot of Puerto Ricans from that era was there, was just, there were jobs available up here. The Puerto Rican economy was suffering. As a matter of fact, it was going from an agri agricultural society, mostly uh, sugarcane based and tobacco based and fruits and vegetables that were uh, native to the Caribbean, um, to uh, a different kind of economy. The government of Puerto Rico in the 40s elected the Populares, the uh, popular Democratic Party with uh, Governor Munoz Marin, and they set about trying to correct the island's economy. And so they instituted what was to be the first of, of many similar economic development programs throughout the world, a program called Operation Bootstrap. This was a program uh, that was uh, capital intensive that provided incentives for companies to settle in Puerto Rico. When the industrialization of Puerto Rico was going on, they could no longer make a living farming. My father left the island and he left reluctantly and he left angry, very angry with the situation in Puerto Rico. He hated Munoz Marin um, and he hated the changes that were happening on the island, so he felt he was forced out. I remember my mother used to talk about the story she heard about New York City before she came here. And she used to say that, you know, when she was in Puerto Rico, they would say that the money was, era como lechuga en la calle, that there was money everywhere to be had. And of course, when she got here, she realized the only lechuga to be had was in the store. <laughs> there was no money on the street. And making that living was not easy. Before you had West Side Story and Puerto Ricans became a, a, a national phenomena, um, you, it, Puerto Ricans came with, with a, a certain sense of entitlement, you know, they came as citizens. They didn't have to get a visa to come. And so for many Puerto Ricans, there was this whole sense that uh, they were citizens, they came to work, and so why shouldn't they be treated equally as everyone else was? Uh, which I think is a little different uh, uh, sentiment than the sentiment that um, some immigrants uh, uh, bring to other countries where they don't really have you know, they, they are visitors in a sense, uh, you know, without the expectation that, and citizenship is held out as something that, well, if you were just citizens, you know, life would be different for you. Um, and there is a certain acceptance of that, that, well, I'm not a citizen, and maybe I have to be a citizen to expect equal treatment, whereas Puerto Ricans were kind of like, no, we are citizens. We expect equal treatment now. Our folks and the shoulders that we stand on are bruised shoulders and beaten down, but not broken. And they were beaten down by, the, by racism, by classism, by a rejection of people who spoke a different language, who came from a different place, who didn't come from Western Europe. And they all came here just like so many other generations of immigrants. The Germans came, the, the Irish came, the Italians came. They all came seeking opportunity for their families, and that's what, that's what these guys did. New York was chosen for, uh, you know, for two reasons. Uh, one, of course, was the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the boat stopped here. You know, New York City has always been the land of the city of opportunity, the magic city. Everyone gravitates to New York. And since there had been a Puerto Rican uh, presence here in New York City for so many years, it was an easy place to come to. And again, it was also the feeling, if you could make it here, you could make it anywhere. Many uh, originally came from uh, the use of ocean liners, and the liners moved between uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and New York, and so it was the easiest way to come to New York, starting with the, uh, with the island of Manhattan and eventually coming into the Bronx. There was two ways of getting into the United States, to New York. That was by, uh, on ship, uh, called the Marine Tiger, and the early Puerto Ricans were being nicknamed Marine Tigers. May 8, 1934, I was born. Six months after that, my father got on the boat and came to the States because already he had a name as a very good guitarist, musician. And then in 1947, my mother and I came to the States. And I was already 13 years old when I met my father for the first time. 
Evelina Lopez Antonetti took a boat. It was called El Ponce. And uh, it was very heart-wrenching and scary. That's probably how my mother felt going. She hadn't seen my aunt in many years. And she's going to the unknown. And she's leaving what she knows and what she loves. My father, Felipe Torres, came originally and landed on Ellis Island, came by boat as the Pionero Puerto Ricans did. My family was part of that early wave of Puerto Ricans that came to New York City. They came as teenagers. The city that my parents came to is the New York City that you saw in Las Memorias de Bernardo Vega, for example, where he talks about the growing population of, of Puerto Ricans in New York, primarily at that point centered in El Barrio. In addition to that, East Harlem had been uh, largely inhabited by Italians who had come a generation earlier, and Italians uh, share the same romantic language roots uh, since Italian and Spanish come from the same Latin root, and so uh, there was more of a comfort zone. My father came here when he was uh, already of high school age, and he didn't know English, and consequently he learned it in high school through an Italian young man who was a classmate of his. They sat next to each other, and he spoke Italian. My father spoke Spanish, so they were able to communicate, and they became friends, and that's how my, my father learned English. Uh, the migration slowed and practically stopped in the 1930s because of the Great Depression. There was uh, no air service uh, during the war, and uh, air service really didn't become popular until after the war on a general basis for the general public, for those who were not wealthy. now made it easier for people to come. The, the voyage was shorter. Uh, it was relatively accessible uh, in that it wasn't uh, out of reach economically. That was also very important in terms of Puerto Ricans migrating to New York City during this time. Puerto Rican migration to New York in the 40s through the 1970s took a big jump. It went from about the average of 50,000 Puerto Ricans in New York City to over 800,000 Puerto Ricans in New York City. For my mother, the trip was really a pilgrimage because, you know, she was she came with her mother and her three sisters, and it was a big event. It was really, you know, for her, it was saying goodbye to the island, like she remembers. And because she was 12, you know, she she remembers vividly. She's the oldest of the of the of the girls, so she remembers the trip. I mean, it was also a long flight. We came by plane, and it was uh, uh, an Air Force uh, airplane. I can remember because the type of seats they had, and when I look at footage from our uh, airplane, Air Force, the same seat. I remember guys making the sign of the cross and crying, looking out the window because they were leaving Puerto Rico. And I think now that I'm older, I realize that maybe they knew they weren't coming back. And I wonder how many of them are buried in St. Raymond Cemetery or somewhere else and never got to go back. My first experience was really an interesting one that I've always carried with me. Very funny, very profound. My father dressed us. He sent us the uniforms, the, the, the clothing we were going to wear. But he dressed us thinking of Puerto Rico in March. So we arrived in icy New York in short pants with short sleeves because he dressed us for leaving Puerto Rico instead of arriving in New York. So my first impression, which I remember to this day, and we're talking 55 years later, I remember being very cold as I arrived. Bronx at the time uh, was a very largely middle-class borough uh, of second-generation immigrants. When I was growing up, when I was a child, I didn't have my own room until I was eight. And that's when my brother went off. Uh, he got his commission in the Air Force and went off. But uh, from the age of being born to the age of eight, I slept on a cot in my parents' room. We just didn't have that kind of luxury. because my, my brother had his room, 
my sister at her room, and I had the cot. <laughs> Families began to move when they needed more space. Uh, they had children and they were looking. And so those um, apartments, which were better apartments than the apartments, for example, in the Lower East Side, where um, these were some of the original tenement housing apartments that people moved into around the turn of the century, uh, had uh, bathrooms outside, for example, of the apartments, uh, or shared by two or more units on a floor. Uh, in the Bronx, you had your own bathroom, <laughs> and that was in, in the house. When we were from uh, here from Puerto Rico, they were, we were living in an apartment with 13, two-room apartment, 13 people in that apartment. So it was very rough, you know. In those days, it was, how do we say, you were moving up in status when you moved to the Bronx. The dream of anybody that was living in New York City at the time, uh, in any of the poorer neighborhoods, was to be able to get into one of the housing projects. The Bronx saw uh, an economic boon and a housing boon right after they decided to build subways, subway extensions. And it was the country. It was, it was a place that many European groups, my own family included, had moved to out of Manhattan. Transportation clearly was very important, and the Bronx is, is uh, very well serviced. It's one of the reasons I, I still love the Bronx. Uh, it's very well serviced by um, subway public transportation. Uh, and I think that was very important in terms of people getting to jobs. Many people worked in the garment sector or in the city of New York and the hotel industry, just like immigrants work today. Um, and so I think being able to get to get there uh, to, from their jobs was very important. Puerto Ricans kind of arrived when this had all happened. People had moved out of Manhattan. Manhattan was too expensive. Yes, they were poorer areas, and the Puerto Ricans could gravitate there because things were less expensive. But again, being at the bottom of, of the economic strata, they found themselves in, in the less desirable housing. But in the Bronx, the housing was newer. And whereas they found vacancies there, they were able to move in quite nicely and settle and put down roots in certain communities in the Bronx. And it started at the lower part of the Bronx, which proximity to Manhattan is where things start to grow outwards. So as other groups moved outwards and upwards, Puerto Ricans were right behind them. For example, the people who moved to the Grand Concourse from the Lower East Side in a much earlier period, who were um, often the, the children of immigrants, you know, wanted to, they didn't want to stay in the Lower East Side, which was where the immigrant population and family lived. And so they began a kind of a status move to the, the, the Grand Concourse, which was touted as, as beautiful housing, like the Champs Elysees in, in Paris. And, and so that was a step up, that was a status move, and maybe they brought mom and pop afterwards and found places for them, so everybody had a status move. Somewhere around, I think roughly 1946, 47, is when my father was in a position to buy a house in the Bronx. And I remember while living in Manhattan, hearing about el Bronx, el Bronx, que sitio más fenomenal, con las calles como que son de cuchilla, que cruzan, que no van derecha, que es difícil, que uno se va a perder por ahí. But it was very exciting to me. We could have gone just about anywhere, but we came to the Bronx. And I think part of it was the story that came before us. Um, people looked at the Bronx in a sense as a place of opportunity and almost like the country in a sense. I mean, if you, if you go back to the early part of the last century, it's the early 1900s and, and this Grand Concourse Boulevard is built and the IRT number four line, 1906, gets put up the, into the Bronx and people are leaving Manhattan and going to buy homes, to rent apartments, to live with space. I grew up uh, first in 281 Cortland Avenue in the Melrose Housing Projects on East 153rd Street and Cortland Avenue. And then we moved further up. I remember we lived on the sixth floor and then we moved further up to 681 Cortland Avenue and we moved to the 12th floor apartment 12A. And those were some of the best times of my life because at the time I didn't realize that the South Bronx was, consi was considered a place of urban decay. Uh, to me it was just where I grew up, where, where I had my friends and where I learned all of this incredible music that today uh, I, I, uh, I perform and, and teach about. When I was seven, when I hit the sidewalk, I was in heaven. 
all of a sudden I had this whole other world open up to me. 181st Street and Mapes Avenue, that was the center of the world. That was the crossroads of the universe for me. Anybody who grew up in the Bronx knows that um, it was the best place in the whole world, the most diverse. People left their doors open uh, in the projects. You knew everybody that was on your floor. Basically, the uh, people that were of Hispanic origin in the projects all knew each other. We had a schoolyard and we had basketball courts, a baseball field, handball courts, and, and an open asphalt field. Not too much grass. Um, and uh, we played lots of basketball. <laughs> Um, and it was Peter Johnson and Julio Rodriguez and Adolfo Carrillo and so we and Larry Manetti. So we had a, an Italian kid, an African American kid, a couple of Puerto Rican kids, a Jewish kid, all blood brothers, by the way, because we all pricked our fingers and shared blood and said we are blood brothers. We shared in the innocence of growing up in a New York City neighborhood and not understanding the difference of race or ethnicity. Simply growing up as New York kids. We grew up on Wheeler Avenue, and I was there till I was nine. And when we were growing up, I guess we were the most dominant force on the block because we had, uh, you know, our, our family was in these two houses. But the neighborhood was very mixed. There were still some elderly people who were Jewish couples who had been in the Bronx for many years. There was an Ecuadorian family across the street. The bodega, the corner grocery store, the one that was on 153rd Street and Cortland Avenue, was for us a meeting place. They always had a libreta, a notebook there, para, para comprar a fiao, like they said, you know, you buy on credit. And I remember that distinctly. My mother used to go there and tell the gentleman, I am giving you $5 now, and she, he'd mark it down because maybe she owed $50 or something. And it was nothing, you know, it was like, ghetto credit. I mean, it was fantastic. It was all based on trust. On the block, there were a lot of children, and everybody knew each other. I remember the two houses down, there was Doña Crescencia, and Don, you know, everybody was called Mr. and Mrs. in Spanish. So some of them were, were Hispanic and some of them weren't. My father used to take me on 153rd Street, 153rd Street, to an Italian barber. And when he walked in, they you knew him by his first name. Hey, Jose, you know, oh, this is your bambino, you know, what's his name, etc. They cut my hair. They would be speaking in Italian. Of course, I could understand some of it because it's very similar to Spanish. This was in the, in the 60s. You know, it was very calm. I have to say, I never witnessed any um, violence or any, you know, or any negativity growing up. We were really sheltered. If we can get all 61 neighborhoods in the Bronx, to operate that way. That when you're growing up there, all you really care about is you, you wanna make sure you, you, you're, pl you're, playing in your, you're playing sports, you're going to school. If you step out of line, somebody, if your parents don't tell you something, somebody's gonna say you're, you're out of line. We knew the cop who was in our neighborhood. He knew all of us by name. So there was this sense, he would show up at the door if he had to. Mrs. Carrier, Adolfo was, you know, I found him by, behind the school and da da da. <laughs> I won't tell the stories, but, you know, a few times, I, you know, it, it was good. The advantages that Puerto Ricans had over earlier immigrants, and I know this just from studying immigration and trying to find documentation for people who are doing their genealogies and their family histories, we can't necessarily find passenger lists for Puerto Ricans because they weren't listed as aliens. They were American citizens. So they came here with the full benefits of American citizenship and could integrate themselves quite easily because of, of, of the things that were available to them. However, the language barrier very often was the, was the thing that they found themselves being tripped up on and what they were being resented for was that strong identification with Spanish as the primary language. Spanish is the uh, first language of Puerto Ricans. Uh, even though we are a U.S. territory and by birth we are U.S. citizens. Um, but my parents, their uh, brothers and sisters, my uncles and aunts, my grandparents, and so many other relatives and so many Puerto Ricans had a, a critical barrier which was the language. They did not speak English fluently. 
it's hard sometimes to convey to people how different those times were because today uh, you can pretty much find someone who speaks Spanish anywhere in New York City. It's, I mean, even people who are not native Spanish speakers understand some Spanish and speak some Spanish. Whereas at that time, there was really a, um, a, a negativity attached to speaking Spanish. So that if you spoke Spanish, it was, um, it was almost taboo. It was embarrassing to speak Spanish. Uh, it, and I'm talking about early on. And it was uh, the way in which people um, really dismissed you. It was nearly impossible for you to speak Spanish in this city. There was a risk behind that. There was a risk. People resented you for speaking another language. English is spoken here, that's it. Whether in, in your neighborhood, whether in the factories where you work, anywhere. When I was first brought into this country, my name was Jose Angel Rivera Padilla de Cruz. And the minute I went into public school, they say we don't have enough time in the day to call everybody by their full name. So therefore, your name is Joseph Rivera. And I didn't quite like that. And unfortunately, I, I say unfortunately, I, I found myself compromising myself and accepting the name Jose Rivera, but never Joseph. That's not the name that my mother and my father gave me. They had to break that barrier and and insert themselves into the workplace, and it was very difficult, and they, had, they were made fun of. Their accents were made fun of. They suffered the difficulty of working in, a, in, in, in places where they had to explain themselves several times over and learn the language as they went along. But they did what New Yorkers do. What Amer This is the great American story of people coming here and against great resistance and difficulty, inserting themselves into the American experiment and creating success. Evelina Lopez Antonetti didn't know English, but she picked it up very fast. Her thing was, I don't know English, I have to learn it. Déjame tirarme. When I would come home, we would speak Spanish because my mother spoke to us in Spanish. I remember learning all of my prayers in Spanish. The Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Act of Contrition, I used, knew them by heart. I remember distinctly re reciting them when I was a little kid. My mother was not dominant in English, so she sort of learned English, perfected it through me. She still has an accent, but uh, I remember distinctly, you know, having conversations with her and helping her to pronounce certain words. Puerto Ricans were uh, responsible for um, the uh, consent decree, where essentially Puerto Ricans took the Board of Education to court. Puerto Ricans uh, realized their children were not being taught in the schools. And so they said, you know, you have a responsibility to teach our children. If they don't speak English, it doesn't mean that they're stupid. It means they don't speak English. So you have to find a way to teach them. I know, having come to the city at the age of 12, not being able to speak English, how amazed all of the teachers were at the remarkable improvement in my intelligence quotient as I went on from gra one grade to the other. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that all that happened was that I learned to speak English. If it had not been for the Puerto Ricans of New York City, I don't think we would have had this explosion in other Latino migration. I mean, look at New York City now. It's Mexican. It's Dominican. It's Ecuadorian. Hay de todo aquí. There's a reason for that. Puerto Ricans came here. They paved the way. They paved the way in a lot of very real ways in terms of legal struggles around voting, around education, around housing. And then in the 1960s and 70s, where there was an explosion of community-based organizing in the Bronx, primarily based around churches, by the way. The Catholic Church was very important. There were also, though, later on, um, one of the ways in which the Puerto Rican community dealt with some of the problems that were confronting the community was that there were Pentecostal churches that developed. These Pentecostal churches were, were extremely important because later on when the community became ravaged um, by drugs, and these drugs really came in um, as a result of the Korean War, and this is a community that had never experienced, had any experience with drugs before, 
And at that time, there were no methadone programs. There were, weren't any programs at all. People who were arrested for um, consuming or selling drugs, just for possession of drugs, were sent to uh, federal penitentiaries. And that's, that's how they were dealt with. And so everybody became a felon who had been involved in that. There, no one knew how to deal with this. And there wasn't that much interest in dealing with it because it was confined to these communities that were politically insignificant. It was the Pentecostal churches that began to work with the people addicted to drugs, the people who had no place to go. And they would literally pick them up at, you know, from at the you know, doorstep bring them in and help them th to go through a religious conversion in which they utilize their experience um, to help others. They would then become preachers to people who were in the throes of drugs. And that was, and that was something that came strictly from the Puerto Rican community. That was another way in which the Puerto Rican community dealt with a problem that nobody else was dealing with. And I'm not sure that they've ever been given full credit for that. We're not talking about some like little nostalgic, sentimental thing. Talk about something very real. The first indications of entrepreneurial efforts we see in the late 19th century, where you have this uh, small community of people um, who had their own businesses, um, who ran these businesses for Puerto Rican and other Latino clientele. One of the very early businesses uh, owned by a Puerto Rican uh, was a shoe store located on Brook Avenue and 138th Street. Uh, it was called the Mayaguez Shoe Store. And uh, that, of course, is a sure sign <laughs> that the proprietor was Puerto Rican and obviously from Mayaguez. Puerto Ricans got here like every other group. They found what they could. They became street vendors, many of them, you know. Um, New York has always been a street vendor town. My grandfather started to sell vegetables and vianda from, from kind of a little stand on the street. And eventually he, he grew that business with his sons. As uh, you have a critical mass of, of Puerto Ricans in the area, you have uh, people who want to cater to the type of foods uh, that they eat and the type of customs that they have. And so consequently, you have uh, people who open up what were originally called uh, by their signs uh, Spanish-American groceries, uh, which we today, of course, call bodegas. Bodega in Latin America is a general food store, basically the local general store. Many of the bodegas that they first began to take over were bodegas that had been owned either by Italians or Spanish or other people that had come before them. They had all these bodegas, but it, they, they established bodegas at a time where this whole entrepreneurial thrust wasn't given much credit. The bodegas provided financial security for the family and my brothers, and at one point my father, when he married my mother, was working in the bodega for like 10 years. So kind of our livelihood was all derived from the bodegas. And so that allowed my father to function here as a businessman, even though bodegas were small businesses. I mean, they were not businesses that were trying to turn a profit. You know, they were businesses that people used to, you know, kind of provide a life and they didn't go hungry. Myself, having grown up in the Bronx in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, remember very distinctly Puerto Ricans making inroads again into the political process, which is you, where you gain advantages for your people. You know, you represent your people, you have certain concerns that your population wants you to represent them on. One of those who did was a, a man who, as a, uh, a teenager, fought in World War I. Uh, came to New York City in the 1920s. His name was Felipe Torres. He went to college and then he went to Fordham University Law School. And at Fordham University Law School, uh, after graduation, he became a lawyer. In 1953, uh, with an increasing Puerto Rican migration, uh, he was chosen to run for the New York State Assembly from that area and he won and he became the very first Puerto Rican ever to hold elective office uh, from the Bronx. Felipe Torres, mi papá, was a very strong individual, very focused on bettering himself and on bettering the community. My father was named by Robert F. Wagner 
to the family court, as a judge for the family court. I remember the ceremony, the swearing in of my father as a judge uh, by Mayor Robert F. Wagner. There was a great deal of pride not only on his part, but I certainly speak for myself and say I know on my part there was. I think the whole family felt that way. It was accomplishment, number one, because he was Puerto Riqueño, because he had an accent, because he was brown skinned. And I keep emphasizing that because we know what have been the difficulties of being a brown skinned or African American member of our society. So for him to have gotten to that point, uh, I think was very, very significant. Felipe Torres recognized that in order for the Puerto Rican community to move forward, they had to exhibit concretely their power as a voting block. And so voter registration involved the issue of whether the ballots could be available in Spanish. I think there was something about the fact that they had only been in English, and then how can our community, who can't in some cases read English, do anything about becoming a voter? So this was a passion of his. Today, there's been quite a bit of progress. You know, we have sitting members of Congress, we have members of the city council, we have state senators and assembly members, the third borough president, and I remember uh, some of the earliest days uh, picnicking in Van Cortland Park and this gentleman coming around campaigning for the borough presidency. And my father was very impressed with this young, handsome fellow by the name of Herman Badillo. And uh, he, made, he made a very good impression among the earlier groups of people who had been here, whether it be the Irish or the Italians or the Jews. And as a result, Herman Badillo found himself elected because he was capable and he came across very well. We are not here to threaten or to beg. We are here to participate. And the power that we seek is essentially the power to persuade and the power to elect and to be elected. So the hopes and aspirations of, of other Puerto Ricans within the community they see where they can take these things and uh, followed Herman into politics and into getting involved in their communities. And that's, that's a very strong component of getting things done for your community, whether it be entirely Puerto Rican or mixed, whatever the case may be, the way you get attention is strength in numbers. And politics has always been that vehicle for that. I got elected in a special election on March 20th of 1990, because that was the date we had arrived from Puerto Rico. And I wanted as a tribute to my parents, who were no longer living on March 28th of 1990, to get sworn in to Congress on the day that we had arrived from Puerto Rico on March 28th. And I'll never forget that. I'm really proud that Puerto Ricans collectively, as a community and as individuals, uh, because we were here first, because we were in a second generation first, because we had the facility that citizenship brings and we had the facility of language, I think that we've made extraordinary contributions and made life better. I actually worked with many people like um, Evelina Antonetti in the Bronx, United Bronx Parents, who was an incredible woman who did so much to empower parents and her organization is still standing there today. It's run by her daughter. Evelina Lopez Antonetti, and I'm very proud to say my mother, um, many years ago said to me, Lorraine, we need a place where our people who have a lot of needs, but who are very proud, can have a comfortable, safe place where they can come in and say, I don't understand, I need, can you help me? We were able to, to get a storefront, uh, which belonged to a cousin of ours, and we started United Bronx Parents there. In the Bronx, we had this dynamic lady named Avelina Antonetti, who began to recognize that what was good for others, good for us, meaning what? Good education. If you want to be successful in this society, you need to have a good education. So she organized the United Bronx Parents made our parents, you know, for parents of school children, and she began to be heard. Congress had an educational hearing. They wanted to hear from the people themselves what was their experience with their educational system. Needless to say, that was right up Mother's Alley, and she took a bunch of people 
uh, to Washington to this uh, hearing. And one woman uh, sitting next to her was trying to testify in English and was having great difficulty because that wasn't her first language. And my mother overheard one of the congressional aides saying, oh, I wish that woman would hurry up and shut up. Well, needless to say, in one swoop, my mother grabbed the woman, sat her down, and said, no, you shut up and you listen. And the city of New York began to listen to them. From Robert Wagner, the mayor in the 50s, uh, to uh, John Lindsay. This is a very important uh, and proud and significant day for the Puerto Rican community of New York City uh, and for our whole city of New York because it marks the subordination of political, economic, and social differences into a common, united quest for progress. And it represents a striking and convincing demonstration of the maturity and the strength of New York's newest and fastest growing community. I wonder our parents understand at a visceral level that perhaps the only way our family is going to progress is if the kids get an education, pure and simple. And so groups like United Bronx Parents really help to propel that and to demand proper services and then also to offer their own services in a setting that was familiar culturally and in terms of geography too. So those were, you know, really vital. They did that in those days. They're still doing it today. The daughters of Avelina Toretti are still there providing these services. Puerto Rican community retained a very strong sense of cultural identity and identification, uh, which was continued, I think, really from Puerto Rico. And here, um, within the, the New York environment, became even more intense. Part of the, the way in which um, Puerto Ricans kept their traditions alive was because they kept the language alive. Felipe Torres and his wife, my mother, Inocencia Bello de Torres, required that all the children learn to read and write Spanish. So every night as children, we had to take out our Spanish textbook and we had to read to my mother or my father in Spanish. The family had dinner together. Uh, I, I was outside playing basketball four or five hours, you know. Um, but I knew that dinner time, everything had to stop. I had to go wash up and I had to be at the table. And it was a time to catch up. It was a time to talk about the news of the day. It was a time to sometimes get disciplined because, you know, <laughs> um, certain things happen during the day. We kept our traditions alive by the food that we ate. Arroz con habichuela, plátano frito. Paella, you know, carne mechada, cabrito en fricas, everything that has to do with the, the goodies. I love my arroz con pasteles. Uh, mi pernil, ajo con gandule, and I love my large salsa. In the 50s, into the 60s, and probably in the 40s as well, um, there were hometown associations. These hometown associations actually were the backbone for the Puerto Rican Day Parade. Puerto Rican began to organize themselves uh, and naming their organization after the towns that they came from Puerto Rico. And there were always Miss uh, Cabo Rojo, Miss Cabo Rojo Ausente, Miss uh, Aguadilla. Every hometown association elected its uh, beauty queen. I participated in what I thought was the first Puerto Rican Day Parade. It, uh, to me, it was uh, like one of the first. I mean, it happened in the Hans Point section. Uh, you know, we participated in riding bicycles. Uh, whoever had a car, a convertible, well, that was the float. Uh, later on, by 1956, 50, 57, they began to organize the first Puerto Rican Day Parade. It is said, not by me, but by journalists who are not Hispanic, that this has become 
the biggest parade, not only in New York, but in the United States. I remember as a child going with my father to buy um, like guitar stuff, like strings, black diamond guitar strings, I remember. Casa Madeo, we saw it later. We'd see it around. My cousin stayed living on Beck Street, so every now and then my father would, you know, duck in there and, and buy an LP or something like that. So, I mean, you were aware of these places. Um, it wasn't until I was an adult that I walked in there on my own that I realized what a treasure we have and still have in a place like Casa Madeo where really, I mean, there's a, there's a man standing there behind the counter who can tell you about the history of Puerto Rican music at the drop of a hat. When I was 23 years old, I had already 80 songs recorded, which is, uh, it was very big. They used to call me El Benjamin de los Compositores in New York, because everybody that went to record right away, the uh, record company would say, go and see Mike Camarero. This kid has a lot of music, but he's good. I'm the kind of a, of, of a composer that uh, if I don't feel it, I don't write it. He composed for Cuba, for Mexico, for Quiqueya, and Amadeo continues to keep alive the tradition, the culture of music. You go into Amadeo uh, store and you're gonna find what you didn't believe that was ever recorded. Lo que me vayan a dar, que me lo den en vida. No vayan a esperar después de mi partida. Yo no quiero que me pase lo que le pasó a Daniel, al maestro Pedro Flores y al glorioso Rafael. Por eso lo que me vayan a dar, que me lo den en vida. Que me lo den, que me lo den. Our strength is our culture, and we must absolutely keep it alive and moving forward. I keep my Puerto Rican traditions very much alive here in my own home. Pedro Albizu Campos has a beautiful quote that I love, and basically in English, it says that if one isn't proud of their own origin, then uh, one will never achieve anything because one uh, is insulting oneself if they're not proud of one's, whence they came. I attended the Berklee College of Music in Boston, a very prestigious institution uh, in terms of the world of jazz, and I happened to be the first Puerto Rican to be at the school, and uh, I happened to be the first one to graduate also. Uh, so I'm very proud of that fact and uh, in many ways I opened the door in my own little way for others that came, whether they came from the island or from New York itself. The one thing I remember distinctly, which is very heartfelt for me, is in the old days in the Bronx, in the summertime, you heard the sound of congas all the time. So as soon as it started getting warm, all of a sudden you hear So se formaba la rumba. You'd hear Cuban guaguancó played by mostly Puerto Ricans in the park. And of course, when the drum calls, everybody starts gathering around. It didn't matter if you were African-American, uh, Anglo, uh, Puerto Rican, Dominican. It, it was a great unifying thing. Vamos rumbero, 
que la rumba ya va a empezar. Vamos, rumbero, que la rumba ya va a empezar. Vamos, rumbero, que la rumba ya va a empezar. Vamos, rumbero, que la rumba ya va a empezar. Ajá, ya va a empezar, oye lo bien, allá va a empezar, échale candela, ya va a empezar, oye bien, allá va a empezar, oye, ya va a empezar, ven pa' acá, ya va a empezar, baila los mulatas, ya va a empezar, mi rumba buena, avanza, la baila, la baila, la baila, la baila, avanza, ya va a empezar, ya va a empezar, ya va a empezar, ya va a empezar, ya va a empezar. Ya va a empezar, ya va a empezar, ya va a empezar, ajá, ya va a empezar. The secret to getting where you want to get is realizing where you're from. Don't ever forget that. I don't care what anybody says. Don't ever forget that. Because that will give you the drive to move forward. Clearly there's a hunger to to learn more about the history of Puerto Rico and the contributions of Puerto Ricans. And I'm hoping that those of us who are, uh, who are at a comfortable you know, place professionally will come together to make sure that um, we restore that history. So we're not a vanishing breed. We're branching out like that tree. You know, we're branching out all over this country. My parents were great Americans, but they were great Puerto Ricans. And they always taught me by their behavior and some things that you could do both. We would have such a rich, fantastic society if people can just desarrollar and let out the beauty and the productivity that's inside of them. My message to all Puerto Ricans that came from the island are here now uh, and our future uh, generations to come because we'll be here for a while. And uh, I just would like them to uh, do the best they can to maintain their costumbre. Looking back on the history of uh, the Puerto Rican community uh, in the United States, I feel very proud to have been part of that history with all its, its, its tragedies and, and successes. That's the American story. That's the Puerto Rican story. That's the Bronx story. Is it love?